Have you ever wondered what the difference between translations are? And which translation you should be looking at when trying to understand the Bible? That's what we'll talk about today. When the world beats you down, open up your Bible. Lisa Turkust. I wasn't going to find another Bible translation quote in a million years. Today we're going to continue our conversation from the book, Why Should I Trust the Bible? Answers to Real Questions and Doubts People Have About the Bible from William D. Mounts. Again, he was part of the translation of ESV and NIV, so his experience in translation is top-notch. I thought his last discussion about how we find it difficult to translate the Bible because they're ancient languages, they don't have direct connections to our culture, we try to do the best job we can. And there's two divergent ways we can go. Do we do it word for word, letter for letter, and make it very hard to understand? Or do we capture the essence of what's being said in the Bible, even if it's not exactly the right words? We talked about that example where it said, God is long-nosed, which means God is patient. Which words do we use when we're translating the Bible? Just to finish up the conversation from last week, we talk about the idea that if we say, I want a literal translation, I want to know what they really said. He says, if there's the word key, does it mean that we lost our keys? Or what is the key idea you're trying to say? Or I sang from the top of the key. Or I love key lime pie. Or he gave the funny sentence, I ate my first key lime pie in Key West, Florida, Keys. Mm. So now we have to look at what's going on around the passages to know exactly what it is we're trying to say. He gives the other example about when they're talking in 1 Timothy about an elder should be married to one woman. And it can be translated woman or wife. So he should be with one wife. He should be with one woman. Does that mean he has to be married? Or what happens if he has two wives? We want to know exactly what it is we mean because we're looking to understand what the passage is saying about someone who should be an elder in the church. It's a pretty important point. Then he said the important part is, you know, saying where is our audience at? Are we looking for the common reader to be able to understand exactly what's going on? Are we looking at scholars? Are we looking at people in another language or another culture? He said, quote, Translations like ESV are comfortable with longer, more complicated sentences and larger words. So he said that most people who are reading it are going to be people who are pretty well read, but want to know what the Bible is really saying. So to know some things about ESV, this is currently the Bible translation I'm using. I used to do NIV, but now I switched to ESV. It was first released in 2001 and it was considered to be a translation for the 21st century, meaning that it's going to use words and ideas that are easier to read in English in modern terms. It says that ESV is considered to be a literal translation, meaning it's trying to do word for word as best it can, which is like King James, New King James, NASB, which we'll talk about in a moment, that's the New American Standard Bible, but they're trying to make it as accurate word for word while still using modern language as possible. And ESV in general is considered to be having a solid foundation. It is trying to keep the actual meaning and ideas behind the Bible true. And so the translators really understood Greek and Hebrew. They tried to stick to the meaning that's there. It's using the Hebrew Bible. It's using Greek text. And ESV, when it was uh, published first by Crossway, that's the publisher of it, it was done by a whole team of about 100 pastors and scholars. They had a committee that was going through. There's over 400 translations of the Bible, and most of them are trying to be careful, but ESV had very high standards. They also created a study Bible. And it is currently being endorsed by many well-known pastors out there. The ESV is a good candidate for trying to be both accurate and being something that we can all understand. And ESV stands for English Standard Version. NIV comes close to it, a couple of different versions of it. 
It was first published in 1978, and then there were some minor revisions, basically just because we know, understand the technical words a little bit better, that came along in 1984. It is produced by Zondervan and has over 450 million copies of it distributed throughout the world. It is the best-selling translation that's out there. It had a small committee of people who were reviewing the Bible and the translations and trying to determine how the wording should go. The third version came out in 1995 and tried to use inclusive language. So where it could be gender neutral, it tried to be. A lot of people feel like that has gone too far, that there were cases where the gender was known, clearly identified, and that the translation in 1995 went too far. I've also heard some concerns, but I don't know, that on the digital versions, they've been going back and changing some of the wording too. And it mentions that in 2011, there was another revision that tried to change back some of the correction, maybe overcorrection that they had done before. Again, it's a meant to be a more literal translation, and it's used by many, many people. It's a balance that in Wikipedia says that it's a balance between word for word or thought for thought. We talked about that last week. Do we want the right thoughts that were meant behind it or do we want it word for word? And it tries to find that balance between the two. The King James Bible was commissioned in 1604 by King James VI. Include 39 from the Old Testament, 27 from the New Testament, but it also has 14 books from the Apocrypha. And the Apocrypha we talked about in the previous podcast were books that had either authorship problems, maybe it wasn't written by the person they thought, or even date problems. I know that some of them were considered that they were written in 330 AD, notably the Gospel of Thomas. There's a big debate about that. And so many Protestants don't acknowledge the Apocrypha, but I believe Catholics still do. And it wasn't, of course, the first. There was a Bible that was in 1409. That was John Wycliffe. The Wycliffe Bible is still something that is used by many people. But when King James came out, it was a translation done with 47 scholars, even though they said 57 were approved, and it was done through the Church of England. And there were committees at Oxford, Cambridge, and Westminster who helped doing that, and even had some Puritan translators in there as well. So the committee started this work in 1604. And they were finishing the final parts in 1609, and there it was published. In 1769, it had some modern printing done with it. And there was the New King James Bible, which was written to keep the beauty, because it is such beautiful language in the King James Version, but they wanted it to be more understandable, but absolutely faithful to the beauty of the original King James Version. New King James was started out in 1975. They wanted something, again, that was going to be more true to King James, modernizing some of the words like thee and thou. And in 1983, New King James was finished, and the scholarship tried, again, to do a very fair job of it. And so I believe Catholics primarily read King James and New King James Bible. It is my goal someday to read the Bible in the old King James Version, just because I hear it's so beautiful, and I'd love to experience that. The New American Standard Bible is meant to be a contemporary English Bible, and it is produced by the Lachman Foundation, and it was in 1971. It says that NASB is meant to be a literal translation and accurate to an English translation, so more of a formal equivalence. We talked about that in the last podcast as compared to thought for thought. So it's more word for word, less thought for thought. And so they had these basically four philosophies when doing this translation. One, it had to be true to the original language. Two, the grammar had to be correct. Three, it had to be understandable and that Jesus Christ has to have the proper place. One that's been interesting to me lately is the New Living Translation. And it's meant to be thought for thought. We talked about word for word. This is thought for thought. And it means that it's trying to get out the meaning behind the words. It also considers itself to be a literal translation, but it really is 
getting us to what was actually believed about the Bible. And it's trying to bring us to understanding. And the reason this has been appealing to me a little bit is because I'd like to understand it. I'd like to understand what everything is talking about. And there are some very few places in the Bible where we have theological fights over things, you know, when it comes to communion or the role of women in the church. But for the most part, we can read something that is going thought for thought and not worry so much about word for word until we get to some of these very sticky places. It, again, is considered to be a more Protestant evangelical Bible. It is published by Tyndale, and it was published in 1996. Then there's biblical paraphrasing, which means that you're trying to write the Bible in something completely contemporary, without idioms, that gives people a complete understanding of what they're saying. Problem with this is they're not doing word for word or thought for thought. They're doing understanding to understanding about the Bible. But you have to be, again, careful, like the quote from the last episode, to look things up when there's a tricky passage, because it could be leading you into some understanding that's not particularly true. And so they give an example in Wikipedia where it says, NIV, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. King James, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Living Bible, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. And then the message, which says, God is my shepherd, I don't need a thing. So you can see how it's very different, but it's very readable. So while I don't think there's a problem with reading the message, as long as you understand that if you're on a particularly hot button issue, it may not be telling you exactly what you are looking to find out. What is it actually saying in this particular passage? The passage I always look up has to do with the body and blood of Christ at communion. Is it like my body or is my body? This is my blood or is this like my blood? It is a passage I look up to see how the translation is and whether I feel the translation is something I can trust or something I can have, but I certainly am going to look things up when I try to refer to it. There's also a bunch of tools and resources you can do for reading the Bible. We'll talk about that in a future edition, all the different tools that we can use to study the Bible. What I've been using and what I do is I use the Logos software. You can use it on iPad, iPhone. You can also use it on computers. It has both Windows and Mac version of it. And there are some basic kits you can buy with it. And it comes with some editions of the Bible, some you have to pay some money for. And I believe I got NIV when I bought the Lutheran kit when it comes to it. So you can buy kits when it comes to your denomination. But one of the nice things you can do with Logo software is you can actually put them side by side. So I have a particular view where all the Bibles that I regard, NIV, ESV, but then NLT there too, so I can understand the meaning of it, are all there side by side together so I can see exactly what they're trying to say. And you also can get logos on iPad, which makes it so handy when you're sitting on your couch trying to read the Bible. I'm going to put a link in the show notes. I did a review for the NoSilicast podcast about logos Bible software and the pluses and cons of it. It does get rather pricey when you try to buy a lot of books for it, but they have some very good kits together that will give you the basics, some basic tools, some basic translations, and so you can use them. So I think that the Bible translation that's right for you, as long as you understand the word for word, the thought for thought, or maybe just the concept concept, what is going to get you to read the Bible? And then Again, when you get to a tricky passage, you get to something that maybe is a little bit controversial, it's good to read it in a number of translations to see exactly what the passage really said. The nice thing about Logos is that you can also click on the words, and the words will show you the original Greek, Aramaic, Hebrew, so that you can see what the word itself was about. I got into that situation where someone asked me the question about whether God gives us more than we can handle. And was that meant to be you, Jill, or is that meant to be you, the body of Christ? And so I looked up the translation and I looked up the literal word in Greek and found out for the most part, it does talk about you, the community, or you, the city. You know, it's a, it's a more plural you, but there are times when it's used in the singular. So 
again, we can try to figure out exactly what it means to look at a passage and understand the true meaning of it. Logos, I think, helps a great deal in doing that. So my challenge to you is think about some key Bible passages you have and see if you can't look online. There's a number of translations that let you flip between many translations. There's some websites out there like Bible Gateway. That's a good one that will allow you to flip between multiple versions of the Bible. So take a look at the Bible that you like to read that has meant something to you and look something up about it. How it was written, was it meant to be word for word or thought for thought, and make sure that you're reading a translation that's getting at what you're trying to see in the Bible, that's getting to the meaning, the thoughts, and the ideas that you will understand the Word of God better. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. I know that sometimes tools like this might be hard to listen to compared to a book that tells you about Christian living, but I think getting the right Bible translation so that we know we're hearing what God really means to us to hear as best we can in these translations. Have a wonderful week. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and tell a friend. Again, I'm trying to grow the podcast. If you have friends at church who you think might enjoy listening to different topics about the Bible, please let me know. Also remember that I'm planning on doing a a five-day-a-week chapter Bible study, and I think we're going to start sometime in December, but we're going to have a template, we're going to have a schedule, and I think it'll take about three years to go through the Bible chapter by chapter. But if you have any ideas, concerns, if you have a good template that you use when you're studying every chapter in the Bible, send it my way. And you can find me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Have a wonderful week. Remember, I always pray for you. Getting to the right translation of the Bible starts with small steps for sure. Bye.